Thank you for your assistance. Um, State, call your next witness. Yes, you may. You may proceed. Good morning, ma'am. If you please tell the members of the jury your name. I'm Amy Seward, S-I-E-W-E-R-T. And how are you employed? I am employed by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, Orlando Regional Crime Laboratory. How long have you been with FDLE? 11 years. And your current position is what? Crime Laboratory Analyst assigned to the firearms section. Explain to the members of the jury what your duties are as a Crime Laboratory Analyst in the firearms section. Sure. My duties as an analyst are to examine submitted firearms for safety and function, to examine fired ammunition components, uh, that are submitted as evidence to determine if they've come from a particular firearm, as well as distance determinations on clothing. And how long have you been an analyst in the firearm section? I've been an analyst for three years. How long total, uh, or, or you said you'd been in the, uh, with FDLA for 11 years, what did you do prior to being an analyst in the firearm section? I was a forensic technologist for five years in the firearm section, and previous to that, three years as a forensic technologist in the toxicology section. And what did you do as a forensic, forensic technologist in the firearms section? I performed function examinations on firearms. If you would share with the members of the jury, please, your educational background. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry. And what training uh, have you had to prepare you for your duties as a crime laboratory analyst in the firearms section? As a forensic technologist, I completed a six-month FDLE training program which enabled me to perform function operation on functions, excuse me, function examinations on firearms. And then as an analyst, I had an additional 14 months of structured hands-on training in firearms identification. And this included units on firearm operating systems, cartridge case and bullet comparisons, as well as muzzle to object distance determinations. Have you ever been qualified as an expert in the courts of the state of Florida in the areas of firearm function and identification? Yes, I have. How many times? 17. You know, this time I would tender Amy Seward as an expert in the area of firearm identification and function. She may testify as such. Have you had an opportunity to analyze any evidence in the state of Florida versus George Zimmerman under the FDLE case number of 12050-1890? Yes, I have. And specifically, did you examine a firearm and holster in this case? Yes. Y'all may approach the witness. Yes, you may. Ms. Seward, let me ask you to look at 154. I'm just ask you, do you recognize that? I do. And what do you recognize that to be? This is the uh, firearm and holster and magazine that I received as part of this case. All right, would you open the exhibit then? Yes. How do you recognize it to be the same firearm that you analyzed in this case? I recognize it by the FDLE case number, exhibit number, and my initials. <coughs> and what type of firearm is it? It is a 9mm Luger caliber Keltec model PF9 semi automatic pistol. And what do you mean by semi-automatic? In very basic terms, semi-automatic means that a pull of the trigger is required for each shot to be fired. 
And what do you mean specifically by nine millimeter? Nine millimeter refers to the caliber of ammunition that the firearm is designed to fire. Are you familiar with that brand of firearms, the kel brand? Yes. How so? I've had the opportunity to tour their manufacturing facility twice, as well as I have uh, examined many of them over the course of my casework. And did you examine the firearm to determine whether or not it was in working order? Yes, I did. How did you do that? I did a general firearm exam. I took note of the make, model, and serial number, looking at the overall condition of the firearm to determine if it looked safe to test fire. After determining it was safe, I used laboratory and evidence ammunition and the submitted magazine to test fire the pistol. And what did you find when you test fired the gun? It was functional. Right. Your Honor, may she step down to uh, demonstrate in front of the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Seward, if you would step down with um, a gravity go for you. Your Honor, there's a gun lock on the exhibit. May I remove that? So she can explain the function to the jury? Yes, you may. All right. If you would. Um, just. Can you give it to the deputy to clear the gun? Can I ask that? Yeah. Can I ask if I could move to a. You, you may. All right, Ms. Seward, if you would explain to the members of the jury how that firearm and, and anything else you need is for, in terms of the magazine, how it functions. Absolutely. I'm going to start real quick with a basic definition for you. Right here is what we call a cartridge. It's commonly referred to as a bullet, but it contains at the very top of the bullet a cartridge case at the head of primer and inside of it gunpowder. Now these cartridges are loaded into a magazine, which is essentially a container for these cartridges designed to feed into the firearm itself. So cartridges are loaded one on top of another in the magazine. The magazine is then inserted up the magazine well of the pistol, and then the user, typically this is closed, the user will pull back on the slide and release. And as they release the top cartridge from the magazine, will be removed from the top and loaded into the chamber and the pistol will be ready to fire. In order to fire a shot at this point, all you need to do is pull the trigger. All right, and is there a way to load the firearm so that you don't need to pull the slide back to chamber a round? You have to chamber, you have to pull back on the slide to, um, to load a cartridge into the chamber. That's the only way to get it in. All right, if the magazine was full, could that be done? Yes. Explain to him how that is. With a loaded magazine with the capacity of this particular one is seven, you can pull back on the slide and release, and it will load that top cartridge. Then there will be one in the chamber and six in the magazine. If you desire, you can release the magazine, load another one so the magazine would be full for a total of seven in the magazine, reinsert into the pistol, so the total capacity between the magazine and chamber it'll hold is eight. All right. Um, do you recall how many cartridges were with the firearm you received? I received seven cartridges total. All right. And the magazine holds how many? Seven. All right. So if that firearm had been fired with seven in the magazine, does that mean that someone had to place a live round in the chamber? With the way I received it with six in the magazine and an ad additional one, it would be consistent with the magazine fully loaded and one in the chamber at the time it was fired. All right, and does that firearm have any uh, features that prevent an accidental discharge? Yes, it has internal safeties. Um, it is double action only, which means that the firearm cannot be cocked unless the trigger is pulled. Pulling the trigger will both cock and release the hammer which is located back here. It's also shrouded, so you cannot get, get to it to be able to cock it. Um, it also has a hammer block, which is a mechanical piece that prevents the hammer from being in contact with the firing pin unless the trigger is pulled, and then that will drop out of the way and allow the hammer to hit the firing pin. What, does, what do you mean by trigger travel distance? Trigger travel di distance is the distance that the trigger has to be pulled rearward 
in order to release the firing mechanism, or in this case, cock and release the hammer. And what's the distance or relative distance of the trigger travel distance on that particular firearm? This particular gun has a longer distance than most typical pistols. Is that another feature that would help prevent an accidental discharge? Yes. You have to pull back significantly in order to release the firing mechanism. All right. Did you also receive a holster with that exhibit, with that firearm? Yes. All right. Would you show that to the jury and just show them how the two go together? This is the holster. There's that clip on the back. All right, so that would be the, the total size of it if a person were to wear that on their hip, either inside or outside their clothing. Yes. All right, thank you, ma'am. You may resume your seat. Yes, could I ask the deputy to do that? Ms. Seward, what is meant by the term trigger pull? Trigger pull is the amount of force required to release the firing mechanism. And are you able to measure that with any particular firearm? Yes. Did you measure that with this firearm? I did. Explain to the jury how you did that. I hung a series of known weights from the shooting position of the trigger where the finger will rest. And I kept adding weights until the trigger was pulled and the hammer cocked and released. And what did you find when you measured the trigger pull? It was between four and a half and four and three quarter pounds. And is that within the manufacturer's specifications? Yes, it is. Did you also receive a fired cartridge case with this evidence? Yes. How many? I received one fired cartridge case. See what, let me show you states 147. Ask you if you recognize that. I do. And how do you recognize that? F Dealey case number, exhibit number, and my initials. And what do you recognize it to be? It is one fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. When you receive a firearm in a fired casing, are, is it, are you able to determine whether or not that particular casing came from that particular firearm? Yes. How can you do that? With a submitted firearm and magazine, I will use laboratory and or evidence ammunition to test fire that pistol. I will then collect the fired cartridge cases and compare those microscopically to the evidence cartridge case or cases that I have received. And did you do that with the shell casing or cartridge case in this case and also the kel pistol? Yes. And what did you find? The cartridge case was fired in the pistol. Did you also receive some bullet fragments in, in, in with this case? Yes, I did. Here, may I again approach Ms. Seward? Let me show you states 165. Ask you, do you recognize that? Yes. And how do you recognize 165? Again, by the FDLE case number, exhibit number, and my initials. And what is that? What's contained in that exhibit? There is one fired jacket portion two fired bullet jackets, fragments, and one lead core. And when you receive parts of a bullet or fragments of a bullet in a firearm, are you able to compare those to determine whether or not those fragments were fired from a particular firearm? Yes. Explain to the jury how you do that. Similar to the cartridge cases, I'll use the bullets that I've test fired from the submitted firearm and compare those microscopically to the submitted evidence bullet or bullet fragment. And did you do that with the fragments in this case and the kel pistol? I did. What did you find? The fired bullet jacket portion was fired from the pistol. The two smaller fragments were inconclusive, and the bullet core is not suitable for a microscopic examination. Right. And when you say inconclusive, what do you mean? I was not able to determine whether they were or were not fired from the pistol. And why is that? A lack of detail on them. Um, they were very damaged. Uh, they had very small portions of uh, rifling on them. All right. Is it apparent that those fragments hit something, the, the bullet, and cause it to fragment like that? Yes. All right. Did you also receive some clothing in connection with this case? I did. 
And if you receive clothing in connection with a firearms case, are you able to determine or attempt to determine the distance between the muzzle of a firearm and the clothing at the time the firearm was fired? Yes. How, how, how does that work? How do you do that? When a gun is fired, a cloud of partially burned and unburned powder particles, vaporous and particulate lead, as well as smoke and gases, will follow the bullet out the barrel. This cloud can potentially leave a pattern on an object, or if the firearm is in contact with a particular object, no pattern will be left, but other physical effects will be present. All right, and did you conduct those tests in this case with the clothing you received in the nine millimeter pistol? I did. All right, Yarmay, she sat down again? and tell the members of the jury whether or not you recognize it. I do. And how do you recognize it? FBLA case number, exhibit number, and my initials. All right, and is this a, an item of clothing that you examined in this case? Yes, it is. And conducted distance testing on? Yes. All right, if you can put that back in here real quick. Explain to the jury first uh, what this is, uh, what you saw, and what you did. Uh, this was an uh, item of evidence that I examined for a distance determination. And what I did was I was looking at the area surrounding this hole. I was looking for bar, uh, partially burned or unburned gunpowder particles. I was looking for any type of sooting present around this hole as well as looking at the ends of the fibers as to whether they were blackened or singed or melting. And how did you? Whether they were blackened or singed or melted. melted. Okay, yeah, if you would just stand back just a little bit so the court reporter has a visual of you, that would help. Um, what did you do to test fire with this particular item? Did you, did you take a cutting from it or what did you do? I did. I removed a portion of the back of the sweatshirt for uh, testing purposes. All right. And Mr. Delaron, if we could turn this around real quick. Can you show the members of the jury where you removed the fabric to conduct your test? Right in this area. Mr. Delaron, if we could go back that way. Or this way. Thank you. Let me ask you, Mr. Darwin, if you'd grab that packaging out. One fifty-six. You recognize the packaging? Yes. How do you recognize it? FBLA case number, exhibit number, and my initials. And this is obviously a sweatshirt that you examined in the case. Yes. And again, if you can show the members of the jury, the area that you focused on as um, having a bullet that passed through it? This area right here was where I was looking right underneath the Nike swoosh. And as with the previous exhibit, did you make a cutting uh, from the exhibit? I did. All right, and is that uh, depicted on the back of the exhibit, if you would just come around and look? Yes, it is. Okay, both the cutting and then the area on the sweatshirt where it was cut out? Yes. All right, let's just show that to the jury real quick. 
and that's been displayed uh, again with a bullet hole through it from your test fire? Yes. In conducting the test fires, did you capture uh, your analysis with photography? Yes, I did. All right, let me ask you to look then at States 122. Uh, Your Honor, if we could have assistance with the lights. And if I may approach the witness. Yes, ma'am. I'll give you this laser pointer. It works by depressing that button right there at the top. What is stage 1.2 first? This is a picture of the outer sweatshirt that I had examined for distance determination. All right, and explain to the members of the jury um, just the significance of the items uh, that you marked on the exhibit. Sure. This is an overall shot of the um, of the sweatshirt. I measured the distance nine about nine inches down from the top shoulder seam, and approximately seven inches in from the uh, side arm seam. All right. In states one twenty three, what's depicted there? It's a little difficult to see with the. Uh, particular color of the fabric, but what I was looking at here are a few, there are a few gunpowder particles surrounding this as well as some blackening right around the hole, as well as some tearing of the fabric and burning and singeing on the fabric ends that were torn. And is that a close-up, obviously, of the bullet hole on the sweatshirt? Yes, it is. All right. States 124, what is that? That is the inside of that same area. Right here, you can see a little better the blackening that I was looking at. So that's a close-up of the inside of the sweatshirt? Yes. All right. And states 125, what's depicted there? That was the distance test that I had made using a portion of that sweatshirt. All right, and just um, take them through how you conduct the distance test, um, what ammunition you use, and why. Absolutely. Using the submitted pistol and submitted ammunition, I test fired into portions of both garments that I received. And the reason for doing so is the pattern that can be left behind using a particular firearm or ammunition can vary greatly depending on the length of the barrel, the size and style of the bullet, as well as the amount, shape, and burn rate of the gunpowder contained within the cartridge. So you actually used one of the seven live rounds that you received with the exhibit to conduct this test? Yes. All right, States 126, what do we see there? That is a close-up of the distance test that I had made. The arrows are pointing to diagonal tear that occurred in the fabric. And when you conducted the te distance test with the kel pistol in the hooded sweatshirt, what did you determine about the distance between those, the muzzle of the gun and the material at the time the gun was discharged? The clothing displayed residues and physical effects consistent with a contact shot meaning the muzzle or the end of the barrel of the gun was up against the sweatshirt when it was fired? Correct. All right, let's go to States 127. What is that? This is the other sweatshirt that I had received to do distance determination on. And again, you made measurements um, of where the hole is relative on the sweatshirt? Yes. All right, incidentally, um, if both of those sweatshirts were being worn in their intended fashion, that is, forward, um, do the two bullet holes line up? They do. 128, what do we see there? With this, we are looking at the tearing of the fabric. You can see uh, there are a few gunpowder particles, which are not easily depicted in this photo, as well as some light sooting and burning and singeing of the ends of the fabric. In the reddish brown staining, that would be apparently blood. Yes, it is. Right, not something that you apply. No. All right. 
States 129, what is that? The inside of the hole that was in the previous photograph. And again, you can see a little better the, uh, the sooting, the blackening surrounding the Can you uh, hole circle itself. that with, for the jury as best yes, you can? I'm sorry. Okay. All right, in States 130. And this is the test that I had generating, generated using a portion of the back of the garment. And when you conducted that distance test, um, did you also use the nine millimeter firearm as well as the ammunition uh, that was present with the firearm? I conducted that simultaneous to the first one. I had layered the darker um, sweatshirt over the lighter sweatshirt and fired one shot okay, through so both. The, so this so is from the same. Just so we're clear, the hooded sweatshirt you would have put on the outside, the lighter sweatshirt would have been on the inside? Correct. All right, and what did you find uh, distance-wise when you conducted the test with this particular sweatshirt? This as well was consistent with residues and physical effects of a contact shot. So again, um, evidencing that the end of the gun was against the material when it was fired? Yes. All right. And finally, States 131, um, what's depicted there? This is a close-up shot of the test that I had generated with the lighter color sweatshirt depicting a little better that you can see the tearing and the, the blackening of the fabric right, right around the hole. All right. Um, are your findings consistent with the muzzle of the gun having been pressed into the dark hooded sweatshirt and then fired through both the dark hooded sweatshirt and the lighter colored sweatshirt. It is consistent with the muzzle of the firearm touching the, the outer sweatshirt and the inner sweatshirt being in direct contact with that outer one, yes. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Judge, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, do you want to break for lunch at this time, or you're going to? Well, I don't know how long you think um, it'll be. I think I can probably get through it, so we'll get this witness off the stand. It might take me 15 or 20, but I can't imagine it's more than that. Okay. And, and if I get to 20, you can remind me where we are if I don't notice, but I, I'll get through it. Okay. Thank you. If it, we really do hit a snag, I may ask that we break for lunch. Good morning, ma'am. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, I'm going to try and do it sort of the way that you went through it um, in your direct examination. Um, obviously, um, what you've told the jury, you do in a lot of cases where these issues may be in contest, correct? Yes. Where you're trying to determine, for example, that the cartridge found came from the gun. Right? Correct. You know that's not an issue here, right? Yes. And you do a lot of analysis to make sure that the bullet came from the gun in many cases, correct? Yes. And you know that's not an issue here. Yes. Um, and concerning the firearm itself, of course, you need to be able to testify to a jury, this gun can work and can fire a bullet, correct? Yes. You know that's not an issue here. Yes. Judge, I'm sorry, I'm going to interpose an objection as to the legal conclusions by the defense attorney as to what or is not an issue in the case. Okay, thank you. And that will be sustained if you can, if you can rephrase your question. Sure, certainly. Um, from a forensic perspective and from the workload that you needed to do, were you given any indication that, that, any, that there was an issue in whether or not this bullet came from this gun? We're never given an indication whether there's an issue present or not. Okay. So you would take it on and look at it and see what needs to be done to prove up matters even if they may not be in contest? Correct. Okay. So in this case, you were able to document gun works, um, fired, cartridge, fired bullet, correct? Yes. Now let's talk about the gun itself. And if I might approach the witness, Your Honor, with the firearm that's in front of her. Um, if you would, um, I'm actually going to have you testify from where you are right now, but I would ask you to take out the firearm and just hold it, obviously, as you know how to, pointing it nowhere near any other. Um, and I think that you said you have a, a good history and experience in firearms generally, correct? Yes. And you know 
what different types of firearms are used for? Yes. Okay. Um, and that is what's called a double action, correct? Yes. Meaning by that, that you don't need to do, you need to have a certain amount of weight and intent to fire that firearm, correct? What double action refers to is pulling the trigger, cocking, and releasing the firing mechanism. And the very uh, characteristic of being a double action is a safety feature, correct? Yes. Meaning that there are some firearms, or there not, some semi-automatics, where if you actually rack it, if you have a, cha a cartridge in the chamber, it is ready to fire with a very light, almost featherweight pull, correct? Those are referred to as single action firearms. And a single action, if I were to be carrying around a single action without an external safety on it in my hip, it would be quite dangerous, wouldn't it? If the firearm was cocked. Of course. If yes. I've racked one in and it's, it's only on single action now because it has a feather featherweight pull, right? Yes, it has a lighter trigger pull than a double action. So the double action characteristic itself makes it a safer weapon to carry in a ready-to-fire position, correct? With it, with it functioning properly, yes. Of course, presuming for the next few questions that we're talking about firearms that act the way they're supposed to act, okay? Yes. Right. And you know that some weapons are used particularly for self-defense, correct? Yes to protect oneself, correct? Yes. And within that context, a firearm that's to be used for self-defense has to be ready to use, correct? Potentially. You would not want a firearm that has an external safety that would, on a double action, that has an external safety that would require an additional step to make it ready to fire, would you, for a self-defense application? I can't really say as to whether that would be that would be more of a personal preference, I do believe. Okay, let me ask it this way. If, in fact, one was carrying a firearm um, and it had an external safety, what would have to happen before that firearm was ready to fire? The safety would have to be disengaged. It would have to take that extra step to disengage the safety, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, this gun does not have an external safety, correct? No. What exactly then makes this firearm a safe firearm to carry in a loaded way? It's a combination of the fact that it's double action, that it's never cocked until you pull the trigger, as well as the hammer block, as I had stated previously, that prevents the hammer from coming in contact with the firing pin unless the trigger is pulled. With both of these safeties functioning properly, the gun cannot be fired unless the trigger is pulled. So the hammer lock itself is actually an additional safety device, and that basically is a little metal plate that goes between the hammer and the back of the cartridge, correct? Back of the firing pin. Firing pin. Mm -hmm. So, and, on, and if that metal plate is there, it is safe. It cannot fire, correct? Correct. And only when you start pulling on the trigger, which has a four and a half to four and three quarter pull, does that plate drop in order to make the gun active. Yes. Correct? And the very nature of having a four and a half to four and three quarter pound pull is itself a safety feature, correct? The trigger pull itself is not a safety feature. I'm sorry. Having to pull the trigger with that amount of force is a safety feature, correct? No. Well, then why don't you compare for the jury the pull necessary to pull a double action firearm as compared to a single action firearm? Are you talking the trigger travel distance? I'm sorry. I, I use, yes, the tri trigger travel distance. Cannot fire unless the trigger is pulled. And I don't want to get into qualitative terms of safe or not, but is there anything with this particular gun that you found that suggested it was unsafe to carry in a loaded way ready to fire? No. There are probably at least two guns in this room. Um, would you agree that all law enforcement carry their guns ready to fire? I do believe they do. Okay. They're not much use if they're not ready to fire, are they? No.
you had mentioned even as to this weapon, you've had a chance to visit the, uh, the factory where they're made a couple of times? Yes. It's right here in Brevard County, correct? Yes. And you've been there a couple of times to see, to do any concerns with the manufacturer of that weapon? No. Um, from your experience as to how it was utilized in this event, did it, was it, um, did it perform properly? Did it, did it shoot its projectile the way it was supposed to? The gun functioned, yes. Okay. So there was, it, it worked, correct? Yes. And it worked the way it was supposed to? Yes. There was no suggestion that the pull distance was malfunctioning in any form, correct? No, there was no indication that anything on this pistol was malfunctioning. And um, you had mentioned now talking anything that we haven't talked about with the gun and its safety features. No. You had stated in, re in response to how you can load that is that you, um, you have to, and I call rack it, is that the right term? When you pull back the slide? Yes, that's can our term use, that's used. Okay, can we use that so that both you and the jury knows that racking it means pulling the slide back to actually put a cartridge or a bullet in the chamber being ready to fire? Sure. Okay. Um, and you stated that a person, Mr. Zimmerman, since we know it to be his gun, right? Yes. Okay. Would have then racked it to make sure it was in fact ready to fire and then put another bullet in the magazine and reloaded it. Correct? Yes. Is that a usual occurrence in your experience dealing with firearms? I typically see a wide see variety of Okay. Of you what did I'm not using. Sorry, I interrupted. That's you fine. did not consider that to be an unusual occurrence, certainly, no. did you? Okay. Matter of fact, um, the two law enforcement officers here and probably every other law enforcement officer gun you had the chance to see, that is normal that it is one racked in the chamber in a full magazine, correct? Yes. Military do that, correct? I'm unsure. It, in fact, is the way that you make that gun as capable as it can be for whatever the need may be, correct? To have it fully loaded? Yes. Yes. And then we've talked about the shirts themselves, and I'm not going to go into having you look at them just yet. You might be able to avoid that. But you had said that the two shirts sort of lined up, correct? Yes. And by that you mean, obviously, there was a hole through one and a hole through the other. And, and, when you, and when you took the shirts and lined them up, they matched, correct? Correct. You're not suggesting that because of that that the shirts are in any particular configuration on the body, are you? No. Okay. They, they were where they were, but certainly the, the bullet went through both shirts where they were lined up with the bullet hole. Yes. Okay. And um, let's talk about the actual, when you say contact. Mr. Um, Guy suggested pressed into, and I think you corrected him to say it was touching, correct? Yes. There was no evidence, for example, that would show up that you would take a, a, a gun nuzzle and, and push it into the shirt some way where the shirt would fold around it, was there? No, it was consistent with the muzzle of the firearm touching. It was consistent with sweatshirt. this, correct? Yes. Shirt, firearm, wasn't yes. consistent with this, right? Pushing or anything? That would have shown a completely different configuration to you, right? To me, contact is when the muzzle is, is just <coughs> touching the fabric. Okay. Whether it's a light touching or whether it's pressed in all the way, the fact that the muzzle was touching the garment itself was what I had determined. Right. So certainly had the gun actually been sort of smothered by the shirt or by a sheet, then fired, you would have seen a much different patterning on that, right? Because the fire then would have wrapped back around it somewhat? Potentially if it was wrapped around it. Correct. Yes. And matter of fact, any configuration that suggests something other than flat would have shown some different stippling potential or burning from the way the flame would then have bounced around, correct? In terms of farther away or closer? No, if it was in contact, okay. pushed in to the extent that it folded the fabric around it, that would have shown a different type of 
burn pattern potentially, correct? Potentially, if the sweatshirt had gone over the top of the ejection port area, there would possibly be marks from that. But otherwise, whether it was lightly touching or pressed in, it would be the same, same type of um, physical effects that I had seen. And um, when you say touching, uh, is that a term of art actually was touching? Or in this case, when you saw a couple of, I thought you said, you saw a couple of little burn spots of maybe powder that had escaped, is that consistent with being an eighth of an inch away or a quarter of an inch away or what? No, it's consistent with the muzzle touching the garment itself. Okay. And that you can tell because there was some tearing itself. That is the way that a, a projectile at that range rips through the fabric? Yes. Did you do any um, examination to identify the distance that the bullet traveled before it hit Mr. Martin's chest? No, I only examined the clothing for distance determination. I have a moment, Your Do you involve yourself then uh, ever during your experience with FDLE to actually look at um, the injury or flesh wound occurring by a bullet entering it? No, I do examination of clothing. Okay, so whenever the bullet, before it gets to the body is where you stop Correct. in your analysis. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor, for the questions. Thank you, any redirect? Just briefly, thank you. Ms. Seward, you were asked questions about whether or not that firearm uh, could be used for self-defense. Could it also be used to commit a murder? The firearm can be used for any purpose. Your Honor, I might because that is speculation um, and would uh, affect the ultimate fact before the jury, the ultimate question before the jury. Same. You were asked about the trigger pull. Can you give the members of the jury an idea of whether or not four pounds or a little bit more than four pounds is a relatively light a relatively heavy trigger pull? Four and a half pounds is within the normal range of trigger pulls that I see in my casework. So it's not a, a heavy trigger pull? No, it is not. And you were asked questions about uh, the firearm being fully loaded. Can you explain to the members of the jury that if the magazine's full mm -hmm. and there's a live round in the chamber, on that particular firearm, what must a person do to expel a bullet? Pull the trigger to fire the, the gun at that point in time. That's it. There's no other, there's nothing they have to turn off or adjust. You just pull the trigger. Correct. All right. But they do make firearms with what you refer to as an external safety, right? Yes. Can you explain to the jury just briefly how those work and the purpose of those? Sure. An external safety is... Typically, a button, a knob, something that you physically have to engage to uh, prevent the, the firearm from firing. And where is that? Lo where are those typically located on the firearm? More times than not, you will find them right back here on either the left or the right side. But okay. those are typically referred to as thumb safeties, as all you need is your thumb to disengage it. And or engage it. that firearm does not have any type of external safety? No. All right. With the firearm in the condition that it is right now, unloaded, are you able to demonstrate for the jury how to pull the trigger and to make that sound? Yes. You know, may she do that? May she demonstrate pointing it into the wall? Yes. I'll use my left just so you can see. And that's all someone would need to do to fire a shot if it was fully loaded? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. That's all I have. Thank you. 
This gun, the safety mechanism, requires that same amount of pull for every time you want to shoot the gun, correct? Yes. You agree that there are other semi-automatic weapons, a number of them, where while the first shot may be a double action pull, the ones after that are single action, correct? Yes, there are some firearms designed that way. And um, Sig Sauer's are all that way, Colts are all that way, right? Some of them, yes. Okay. And what that means is while you can rack it and shoot with a four and a half, five pound pull or distance, um, every other one is featherweight, right? A single pound trigger pull is going to be lighter than a double action trigger pull. But when you have a firearm that's both single action, double action, pulling back on the slide and releasing while you chamber a cartridge will leave the pistol in single action. So firing it that way will be the single action trigger pull, which will be lighter than a double. However, a lot of these firearms also have what's called a decock safety, which is essentially a, another thumb safety where you depress it and it will allow the hammer to fall without causing the gun to fire. And then by pulling the trigger at that stage, it's going to be a double action trigger pull while all remaining ones, if you do not decock, are going to be at the single action um, trigger pull, which is lighter. So with this gun, if I wanted to shoot it one time, four and a half inch pull, correct? Four and a half pound. to four and three quarter pounds, yes. Sorry, four and three quarter pound pull, correct? And then yes. the second shot, again, four and three quarter pound pull, correct? Yes. If I had my Sig Sauer nine millimeter with me and I did the same thing, first one, let's say four and a half pound, correct? Yeah, and, I'm just gonna and take this to the relevance of a, a, a different firearm. Well, oh, any, any other firearm that goes from sing, from double to single, I think you probably could. But I, I, I'm, now I'm moving on to the next question. But we're still talking on firearms other than this firearm. Well, she has now identified if I might be heard. I know, but the objection is relevance. That objection is sustained. Um, then this firearm's additional safety measures is that each pull has to be the full pull, correct? As opposed to shifting to a uh, single action after the first pull. That's a design feature of um of a pistol that's either only single action or only double action, where which it has the same trigger pull for each shot. Which means that even the second, third, and fourth shot require a full four and a half to four and three quarter pound pull. Yes, each pull of the trigger requires the same amount of force. And that is different than it would be if it was a single action, correct? Yes. Thank you. Nothing further on. Any re redirect? No, thank you. May Ms. Seward be excused? She may. Thank you very much. You are excused. Deputy, so please put the lock back on the um, firearm and put it in the box. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and break for lunch. During lunch, um, you're not to discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anybody else. You're not to read or listen to any radio, television, or newspaper reports about the case. You're not to use any type of an electronic device to go on the inter internet to do independent research about the case people, places, things, or terminology, and you're not to read or create any emails, text messages, Twitters, tweets, blogs, or social networking pages about the case. Do I have your assurances that you will abide by these instructions? Okay, um, there's something different going for lunch today, so I'm going to give you some extra time. Um, if We will be back at 1.45. Uh, please put your notepads face down on the chairs and enjoy your lunch. Did you, did you put the lock? And firearms identification. And this included units on firearm operating systems, cartridge case and bullet comparisons, as well as muzzle to object distance determinations. Have you ever been qualified as an expert in the courts of the state of Florida in the areas of firearm function and identification? Yes, I have. How many times? 17. You know, at this time, I would tender Amy Seward as an expert in the area of firearm identification and function. She may testify as such. 
Have you had an opportunity to analyze any evidence in the state of Florida versus George Zimmerman under the FDLE case number of 12050-1890? Yes, I have. And specifically, did you examine a firearm and holster in this case? Yes. Y'all may approach the witness. Yes, you may. Ms. Seward, let me ask you to look at the I'll just ask you, do you recognize that? I do. And what do you recognize that to be? This is the uh, firearm and holster and magazine that I received as part of this case. All right, would you open the exhibit then? Yes. How do you recognize it to be the same firearm that you analyzed in this case? I recognize it by the FDLE case number, exhibit number, and my initials. <coughs> and what type of firearm is it? It is a 9mm Luger caliber kel model PF9 semi-automatic pistol. And what do you mean by semi-automatic? In very basic terms, semi-automatic means that a pull of the trigger is required for each shot to be fired. And what do you mean specifically by 9mm? The Department of Law Enforcement, Orlando Regional Crime Laboratory. How long have you been with FDLE? 11 years. And your current position is what? Crime Laboratory Analyst assigned to the firearm section. Explain to the members of the jury what your duties are as a Crime Laboratory Analyst in the firearm section. Sure. My duties as an analyst are to examine submitted firearms for safety and function, to examine fired ammunition components uh, that are submitted as evidence to determine if they've come from a particular firearm, as well as distance determinations on clothing. And how long have you been an analyst in the firearm section? I've been an analyst for three years. How long total, uh, or, or you said you've been a, uh, with FDLE for 11 years. What did you do prior to being an analyst in the firearm section? I was a forensic technologist for five years in the firearm section, and previous to that, three years as a forensic technologist in the toxicology section. And what did you do as a forensic, forensic technologist in the firearm section? I performed function examinations on firearms. If you would share with the members of the jury, please, your educational background. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry. And what training uh, have you had to prepare you for your duties as a crime laboratory analyst in the firearms section? As a forensic technologist, I completed a six-month FDLE training program, which enabled me to perform function operation on functions, excuse me, function examinations on firearms. And then as an analyst, I had an additional 14 months of structured hands-on training. In Thank you for your assistance. Um, State, call your next witness. Amy Seward. Yes, you may. Be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, Good morning, ma'am. If you please tell the members of the jury your name. I'm Amy Seward, S I E W E R T. And how are you employed? I am employed by the Florida. Nine millimeter refers to the caliber of ammunition that the firearm is designed to fire. Are you familiar with that brand of firearms, the kel brand? Yes. How so? I've had the opportunity to tour their manufacturing facility twice, as well as I have uh, examined many of them over the course of my casework. And did you examine the firearm to determine whether or not it was in working order? Yes, I did. How did you do that? 
I did a general firearm exam. I took note of the make, model, and serial number, looking at the overall condition of the firearm to determine if it looked safe to test fire. After determining it was safe, I used laboratory and evidence ammunition and the submitted magazine to test fire the pistol. And what did you find when you test fired the gun? It was functional. Right. You know, may she step down to uh, demonstrate in front of the jury? Yes, ma'am. Let's see what if you would step down with um, the gravity of the whole thing. Yara, there's a gun lock on the exhibit. May I remove that? So she can explain the function to the jury? Yes, you may. All right. If you would. Um, just. Can you get to the deputy to clear the gun? I was going to ask that. And yeah. I was ask if I could move to a. You can move to her. Her name is Lynn. Save your arm. All right, Ms. Seward, if you would explain to the members of the jury how that firearm and, and anything else you need is for, in terms of the magazine, how it functions. Absolutely. I'm going to start real quick with a basic definition for you. Right here is what we call a cartridge. It's commonly referred to as a bullet, but it contains at the very top of the bullet the cartridge case at the head of primer and inside of it gunpowder. Now these cartridges are loaded into a magazine, which is essentially a container for these cartridges designed to feed into the firearm itself. So cartridges are loaded one on top of another in the magazine. The magazine is then inserted up the magazine well of the pistol, and then the user, typically this is closed, the user will pull back on the slide and release. And as they release the top cartridge from the magazine, will be removed from the top and loaded into the chamber and the pistol will be ready to fire. In order to fire a shot at this point, all you need to do is pull the trigger. All right, and is there a way to load the firearm so that you don't need to pull the slide back to chamber a round? You have to chamber, you have to pull back on the slide to, um, to load a cartridge into the chamber. That's the only way to get it in. All right, if the magazine was full, could that be done? Yes. Explain to him how that is. With a loaded magazine with the capacity of this particular one is seven, you can pull back on the slide and release, and it will load that top cartridge. Then there will be one in the chamber and six in the magazine. If you